Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program under the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm pleased to welcome our guest, Mark Glick, who's the chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. So Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Mitch, glad to be here. So our, our topic today is technical assistance for remote communities. Mark is gonna provide us an overview of this new US DOE program that provides technical assistance to remote communities, uh, remote and island communities to carry out clean energy transition projects and the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute role as a regional partner. So Mark, tell us everything we need to know about this new program. Sure, um, this is called uh, the acronym for its ETIP, but it means the Energy Transition Initiative Partnership Program. And HNEI is a regional partner. Um, it's a collaborative effort that was undertaken by the US Department of Energy. And I'd say that HNEI and the Island Institute from Maine and the Renewable Energy Assistance Project from, from Alaska were really key players in getting the line item funding uh, for this approved by Congress through our delegations. Um, and unfortunately, it took several years for uh, sort of this place-based uh, technical assistance program to actually hit the streets. Um, but we're now in the second year. Uh, we've had two projects come from Hawaii out of a overall uh, set of, uh, I think, nine uh, overall projects uh, nationwide. 11 projects over uh, nationwide. And we're about to enter the second cohort, um, the group of projects that are gonna be solicited. Um, ETIP, it's a collaborative effort set up by the Department of Energy, but it has six regional partners, HNEI being one of them. And it also involves a collection of uh, national participating national laboratories who provide direct technical assistance at their own cost, at no cost to applicants, um, to deal with sort of whatever assistance that a remote or islanded community might need to make an energy transition, uh, to deal with things like solar, wind, geothermal, water, energy efficiency, resource options, just to name a few. So essentially it's free, to the client, I'll call it client. Uh, so there, so the entity doesn't have to come up with their own money. That's already provided. Right. So what's the what's you know ballpark value ish of of what this kind of a program would be worth? Well, the, the annual budget for the program is about three million dollars, and as I mentioned, you know we have six regions and um, and. and Typically, uh, the objective is to try to get at least two major projects in each region. So, you know, you're, you know, basically it means that there's a value of that that pr probably ranges from six to eight hundred thousand dollars per project. You know, the the combined value of that technical assistance. That's significant money. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, based on what's been sort of accumulated in that program, um, it would definitely be no less than, um, you know, uh, say four or $500,000. I mean, it's a significant amount of investment for the time uh, provided by the national laboratories. And the regional partners provide uh, some of the technical assistance support, but also um, we're really critical to the community engagement and the identification of good projects and then helping make sure that these projects are carried out properly. So I'm really curious, like before we get into the nitty gritty of the program, what, what were the first two candidates in, in, the, in the first cohort? What, what kind of projects did they, did they sign up for? Yeah, so... You know, these projects got uh, selected um, late first quarter of last year, got scoped uh, during the second quarter. So there, we're kind of in the middle of them now. Uh, the two projects, one was uh, to map the hybrid microgrid opportunities 
uh, for the uh, island of Oahu. So that means Hawaiian Electric uh, made the application. They really wanted to help developers that were looking at these more complex microgrids that might mm -hmm. involve movement of electrons over um, the utilities owned electrical infrastructure, you know, over their own distribution lines. So if they involve, you know, multiple meters that had to go through their lines, um, where, where would these be located? What kind of use cases or issues uh, would you be solving by creating a microgrid? And, uh, you know, where could these be best um, developed so that any developer that really wanted to look at, you know, um, developing a hybrid microgrid would get a sense from Hawaiian Electric where these are located. Um, the result uh, will ideally be a map that identifies these locations. The other project uh, is in the, uh, the county of Kauai, uh, where the co county of Kauai was really concerned about improving mobility, uh, and particularly in the light of natural disasters that might create congestion on the highway system um, because of, of the over-reliance on single occupancy vehicles. So right. what could be done, uh, particularly among um, tourists, uh, to be able to look at you know, more mass transit or shuttle options uh, to be able to kind of get more people off the roads to kind of reduce these vehicle miles traveled. And, uh, and also to replace uh, some of these um, vehicles with cleaner or renewable energy vehicles like electric vehicles. Right. So how does, uh, how does HNEI manage this project? I mean, do we have a project manager at HNEI that oversees this uh, this uh, project, or how does that work? Well, I'm the principal investigator of the project, uh, and was you know responsible for um, essentially responding to the solicitation uh, to become a regional partner, uh, and also assembling the team. We have two graduate research assistants uh, from the University of Hawaii uh, who are uh, assigned to this effort. And um, we've been very fortunate to get really good, um, you know, graduate students uh, that are really adept at being able to help and work with the nat national labs on the specific uh, approaches. We've done a lot of data collection, for example, um, and we're also thinking through the strategies on the um, mobility modeling. So you know, we're directly engaged in, the, in that respect, but even more than that, um, the labs are really reliant on us uh, to be able to ensure that the community is fully engaged um, and that you know, all of these key players, in the case of um, the county of Kauai, uh, working with um, uh, Christina Kayser, who's the energy program manager there. Uh, she's done a phenomenal job of reaching out to the Department of Transportation, uh, all of the different uh, key players in the transportation scheme, uh, the Economic Development Office, um, and other, other key players that are necessary to pull off this kind of planning effort. All right. So that's a really good experience for the two graduate assistants. I mean, what a great sure. opportunity for them to, you know, flesh out their resumes and get this uh, grassroots uh, expertise working with all these different uh, organizations. So that's 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 really good. Yeah, I mean, the the transferable elements of this is that the remote and islanded communities, uh, which is really what this program is about: resilience, improving making more resilient these remote and islanded communities, uh, they face unique, we all face unique energy challenges because of our isolation, our great geographical isolation, our limited connection with centralized energy systems. Um, and that leads to problems or issues with access, quality, affordability, and reliability that uh, essentially these students who are basically forging new careers, you know, yeah. 
will be able to deal with any place that has those issues and have some practical experience on their resume. So we're excited about being able to provide that kind of support. All right, so you uh, brought some slides along and uh, we should probably launch into your slide deck just to flesh out the description of the, pro the, the program and you know, where it's, where it, how it works. So why don't you start uh, going through some of your slides to tell the people out there in the audience how they can participate in this program? What, what, what's the what's the process here? Yeah, I mean, I've already talked a little bit about ETIP, so I think we could probably jump to slide number four. Yeah. Um, sure. And uh, you know, with with that, we es essentially are looking at um, the kind of communities that would be applicable for having technical assistance. And we're really dealing with uh, potential applicants who could be groups of individuals households, businesses, um, in geographical closeness or proximity to one another. Um, so, you know, the communities, what do we mean by that? Remote uh, are really those isolated from population centers with limited access to, you know, centralized energy systems. Um, island communities are isolated, of course, from the mainland. So every place in Hawaii, you know, is yeah. essentially an island community, but we do have remote communities um, and anybody, you know, even from, uh, you know, Oahu knows that, you know, as you approach the North shore, uh, there are places that are almost isolated hamlets. And if something goes, uh, you know, essentially, especially the coastal, uh, low-lying coastal areas that are in flood inundation areas uh, where they can become extremely isolated in, in times of natural disasters. So being able to operate a safe and reliable energy system in the face of those kinds of issues is something that, you know, perhaps they could get help in getting support to kind of plan uh, how to make their energy system more resilient be an ideal sort of app application for this program. So I, I think your next slide really uh, identifies what kind of technical assistance is available. Um, right. Let's have a look at the next slide and you can go through those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, the overall kind of analysis going on with a uh, technical assistance um, effort, you know, so, you know, if you're an applicant, in addition to describing your community's energy system vulnerabilities that you would like to get some help in resolving, um, we ask what kind of technical assistance your community really needs. So technical assistance can take many forms, and we want to provide some options uh, to help you start brainstorming uh, your application requests. So at the core of any technical assistance is typically a question or a set of questions that technical experts, uh, including us and the DOE's national labs, can answer, um, let's say using data-driven economic and environmental or grid analysis, might be things that you want to start asking about. So the question might include how much of my community's energy consumption could be met with locally generated energy resources? Uh, or what efficiency measures would be the greatest, have the greatest impact on my community's energy consumption? Um, what's the most cost-effective path to meeting our renewable energy goals? And how can we increase our power uh, during extreme weather events uh, to improve reliability? So those are some of the things that you know, if you have any of those ideas or concerns, uh, the application process will help you um, that you can find, and we're gonna show you uh, later the links to, to get to the application, uh, will allow you to sort of explain those issues. And if, if you have a compelling story, you'd be a really prime candidate uh, to get this kind of technical assistance. So uh, what about field work? So I, I see, for example, uh, you know, a, a, an item here for reliability. 
So can you actually send people from, say, NREL and from uh, HNAI out in the field to look at the community, kind of do an inspection, as it were, to say, okay, so what are the obvious uh, spots? Like there's, you know, some pretty old telephone poles here. The power lines are looking pretty bad. We've got trees overgrowing it, yada, yada, yada. So is that part of what we would call uh, part, part of the inspect, part of the process is to really identifying what these liabilities are? Well, I mean, it's, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that level of scoping, the strategic planning really involves uh, more of a dialogue with the community and key members to, exp you know, discuss and explain energy priorities, um, including those that fall into larger community plans. And uh, it could also involve training, uh, you know, educating the project stakeholders about those specifics in the energy transition process. Uh, and as we say, you know, as we discussed before, could involve specific modeling, or it could come up with, uh, you know, it might involve, you know, coming up with a plan for how a microgrid, uh, given what the technical specifications, which would probably be accessed remotely, you know, through either, you know, requests to the utility or through the local planners on, uh, on that kind of information. We were able to gather, for example, with Kauai, uh, the county of Kauai was able to provide critical information, uh, critical data, as well as uh, the uh, State Department of Transportation, as well as the county's uh, transportation planners, uh, to be able to give the labs the uh, hard data that could be analyzed and modeled. Um, and of course, a lot of that can be done extremely well remotely because there's uh, really wonderful um, data shapes and, and maps and, uh, and accessible information uh, to be able to develop those plans. But there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, because of COVID, in the first cohort, there weren't actual on-site meetings, but there were, like everyone else in, in the community, uh, of, the, of these Zoom meetings. And it's almost like we were sitting in the room with everyone uh, as we were, you know, sort of struggling with uh, getting the data and looking at it and, and essentially creating the, the, the plans. And, and then ultimately, uh, as we near solutions, uh, there's a lot of communication involving summarizing these project goals and outcomes to the broad audiences that really need them uh, and to get community input on the next steps. Right. Yeah. Sure, so let's uh, kind of bring up the next slide, which uh, drills down a little bit more into the process, uh, starting on the uh, left, I guess, uh, with uh, convening and committing. You have to make the commitment first, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna yeah. uh, go into uh, too deep of discussion of no. this. this. This essentially is taken directly from the energy transition. This is coming out of the Department of Energy's transition, energy transition playbook. Uh, that uh, Hawaii has been very helpful. In fact, it was the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, which was one of the primary inspirations for this playbook. And uh, I, when I was energy administrator, I actually participated in writing chapters of this. Um, so essentially, if you go to, um, and I, we, I guess we can provide these links, but if you go to the uh, Department of Energy's website and you uh, actually type in energy transition playbook, this will pop up. And this essentially breaks up the community energy transition activities into seven phases uh, from convene and commit to engage and envision all the way to operate and maintain and improve and iterate. So it's sort of their jargon for what steps, you, you know, a community might be, might be in uh, we just think it's probably good for you to look at this uh, to kind of get a sense of where you are in the process. But frankly, you can you don't really need to, to do this. It just might be helpful as you make your application to kind of give you a sense, you know, are you in an early stage or an advanced stage? 
Um, so if we go to the, the next slide, you know, re really, I think the key is about the, this extensive partner network and what are you really getting? Um, the idea, the theory is to employ a community driven approach to identify and plan these strategic clean energy and energy resilient solutions uh, to us to address your specific challenges. So you, you would need to, again, pretty much know what is it that you're missing that you really need help in doing. Uh, and so, you know, we've been very pleased that Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, of course, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, Pacific Northwest uh, National Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratories are there with a team of people that if we describe precisely what this issue is that you're concerned with, we can find the right experts in the labs to be able to be assigned to this if you're, if you're picked. And then right. over a 12 month to 18 month process, um, we'll develop this program and carry it out. We, usually with the first three months, it's really scoping it out and coming up with a very specific project plan. Uh, again, great value to being able to do this with those kinds of partners. Um, so let's you know, uh, pull up the next slide and look at the regional requirements. Regional well, these are requirements. actually, this, this kind of gets you a sense of the national program and, you know, and how kind of diverse it is. Uh, you can see us in the island's picture on the bottom left. Uh, Hawaii is the regional partner over all the Hawaiian islands and the Pacific, um, you know, basically the Pacific, any place in the Pacific region, um, you know, that's an American territory. Uh, so, you know, we have that broad expanse and uh, Alaska has two representatives that are sort of dealing with that region. And we have four other partners uh, from different places, uh, the Island Institute in May, in Maine and, um, and two other regional partners. So this map kind of shows you, um, you know, the, the full extent of that, but um, you can also find places where you can identify uh, the regional partners and to be able to reach out them through email. I am the contact for this region. So uh, very happy for you to email me at mbglick at hawaii.edu um, if you have any questions about this program. So Mark, Apart from the Think Tech Hawaii, how do we get the word out? What's, what's the most effective way of getting, letting people know that this program exists? Well, how, you know, how did the first cohort, how were they found? Right. Yeah. So, you know, the, um, the key way, you know, I think the most important way, because again, you know, there's only two, you know, in cohort two, there will probably only be two projects from our region. Uh, that right. will be able to be funded. Uh, so, you know, people that are really motivated uh, to apply, you know, what I did in the first round was, uh, you know, I not only did we use uh, this Hawaii State Energy Office and their contact list uh, to send out the links of this program. Okay. Uh, we also used the Energy Policy Forum and, uh, you know, its network. There were emails that were sent out. Uh, and we, you know, used, you know, various sort of, uh, you know, email um, and um, social network websites to be able to send out the links to this. But, you know, it's nicer to, you know, wonderful thing about the ThinkTech uh, program is that we're able to talk in a 30 minute expansive way about how this thing really works. So right. hopefully through you know, this program, anybody that's sort of been on the fence about doing this or had just found out about it, will please go to the links or contact me directly. You have until April 15th to apply. So you still have plenty of time uh, to put together a credible application and, and make it work. Um, yeah, you can see now the, the um, you know, the, I guess the information on the on right. the program. 
on that link. So I have another question, a curiosity question. So you go through the program, you get your plan, analyze, and you come up with this document about you know, how you can implement, you know, it's the implementation part, which will take money. So does yeah. this put the community in a good position then to go out and solicit funds to actually implement the program? Can you comment on that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point because, you know, a lot of people, you know, wonder, well, is there money for deployment involved in this program? And you know, while it would have been nice to have that, the first step is usually having a very credible plan and to really fully explore and understand the problem that, that you have or the issue that needs to be resolved. So once you've done it and you've done it in cooperation with a regional partner and a national laboratory that's been assigned to this, you then have, you can typically answer the question of a, of a funding agency and particularly under the, um, under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, you know, where there are 72 programs that are being solicited, you yeah. may very well find yourself, um, you know, that's fitting into one of those programs. If you fully explored it and you've come up with some potential solutions, it should be much better to apply for uh, the actual grant to deploy. Right. I mean, does that make sense to you, Mitch? Yeah, it certainly does. Because uh, there's you know stacks of money uh, lined up there, and like you said, if you if you have the national apps behind it, it gives credibility to your application for these uh, funding authorities, including the U.S. Department of Energy and all the national labs work for the DOE. Um, right. So that's a really good uh, vehicle for getting the money you need to actually implement the program. So I think it's really a great program. Right. So we have about a minute to two minutes left. So uh, Mark, I'd like you to wrap up and uh, give us some major takeaway points uh, that you might like to give the audience. Sure. Well, and again, thanks for the opportunity to visit with you, uh, Mitch, and to talk through this really fascinating program. I mean, I think now that you have a sense of ETIP and the kind of technical assistance that could be provided to help you think through uh, your energy transition and to make your community more resilient, um, I would love to talk to you and to walk you through the application process. So uh, we've shown you where to view the application and I've given you my um, email address, uh, mbglick at hawaii.edu. I'm um, very happy to uh, walk you through the process. Uh, we've had discussions with um, a number of potential applicants for this cohort too, uh, but we would love to see more um, exciting prospects uh, and to hopefully be funded this time and if not, there will be another cohort, um, you know, in another eight to 10 months uh, through, through the next solicitation. So um, we'd strongly encourage you uh, to um, reach out. You know, we're looking for clear and compelling descriptions of, a, of your community's need and, um, and essentially coming up with a, some sort of reasonable technical assistance project that you would like us to help you with. That's great. Okay, we're gonna to have to leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we've been talking story with the chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Mark Glick, about the technical assistance uh, program for remote communities. So thanks to our viewers for, uh, for tuning in and I'm Mitch Yuen, we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.